Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the November FTA Brexit webinar. Uh, this webinar is going to focus on the practical international trade issues facing the UK as we head towards Brexit. Um, I'm head of European policy at FTA and I'm going to take you through a brief introduction um, and state of play before handing over to my colleague Alex Beach, who's FTA head of global policy and who is going to tell you more about the international trade issues uh, that would face all of our members. And we'll then be happy to take some questions, of course, uh, from your side. But first, some uh, webinar house rules. Um, I would be extremely grateful if you could please keep your microphone and telephone muted to avoid any feedback. Um, the webinar is going to be recorded. It is being recorded. And the recording will be made available on the FTA website uh, probably as of tomorrow. So in case you experience any te technical difficulties or issues uh, during the course of the webinar, uh, we're not going to be able to solve them, unfortunately, but you can always go back to the recording of the webinar on the uh, Brexit uh, dedicated section on our FTA website. Uh, if you have a question, as I said, there will be time for it at the end, so please use the chat box to ask any questions throughout the webinar. We're going to try and answer most of them, but if we can't answer all of them, unanswered questions and their answers will be made available to view on the FTA website uh, in the dedicated Brexit section. The decision to leave the EU is going to affect all segments of membership. Uh, today we're going to focus particularly on the importers and exporters uh, that are members of FTA, but it's quite clear that everybody is going to be affected uh, from the operators to the logistics companies down to shippers. FTA has produced an ABC guide uh, to Brexit. We are basically mapping out all the key issues um, which will be of importance to the various segments of membership um, and that we would like government to tackle during the negotiations. I will present that briefly later on. Um, we have organized and we will continue to organize regular Brexit webinars to keep FTA members up to date. Past webinars, as I said, have been recorded and they can all be viewed on the FTA website in the Brexit dedicated section of the website. Next, please. So, Brexit. I mean, obviously, there was the referendum. Um, we've had a lot of comments and announcements since then. But what's really happening? What's next? Well, the political situation at the moment is very fluid. Uh, there are elections which are planned next year in various European countries, and this is likely to change a little bit um, the negotiations because the people we would be negotiating with uh, would be likely to be different in a number of cases. The Article 50 process, that's the name for the process, the legal process whereby we can leave the European Union, um, is probably not going to start uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the next few weeks, but should start no later than by the end of March 2017. This might be delayed a little bit if Parliament um, has to be consulted and has to um, approve this, but government's intention is still very much to trigger Article 50 uh, no later than by March 2017. There will be probably two parallel sets of negotiations going on. Uh, withdrawal arrangements, so that's the divorce settlement if you want, and then a second set of negotiations on the relationship between the UK and the EU post Brexit. Now the two things are, are, are different, but government is very much hoping that they will be negotiated in parallel, and uh, we are already considering what we want in terms of relationship post Brexit um, on the basis that the two things are likely to be discussed in parallel. A wide range of possible models are being considered for the post-Brexit relationship with the EU ahead of Article 50 being triggered. Uh, but the UK would probably seek a tailored deal. This is something that government has said time and time again quite clearly. This, however, is going to take quite a lot of time to negotiate, uh, probably, 
And bearing in mind that spring 2019 is a likely date for effective withdrawal of the UK from the European Union, transitional arrangements are likely and suitable. Uh, this was confirmed yesterday by the Prime Minister at a CBI conference. And this is good for industry because it should give industry time to adapt uh, to the new context and new rules. So this is, this is good news. Minimizing the risk of delays and red tape at borders are likely to be crucial for government in negotiations with a particular focus on the land border with the Republic of Ireland. Uh, what we will also uh, try to focus on is ensuring that permits are not needed to operate in the EU. That will be a priority for the Department for Transport. However, it's useful to bear in mind that limiting immigration uh, is likely to be a red line uh, for the government in negotiation. So we will need to make sure um, that transport and freight are not used as negotiation tools uh, in the negotiations. At the moment, government is inviting evidence in four key areas on the immediate risks to industry and actions the government should take to mitigate these risks, on what government should do during negotiations to boost industry's confidence, especially if the negotiations last a bit longer than plans, uh, on industry's priorities and concerns for the future relationship with the EU, and on the priorities for the UK's relationship uh, with the rest of the world. Obviously, um, during the negotiations and until they are completed, there will be no practical changes. EU rules and obligations uh, remain in force for now, and that will be the case until the UK formally leaves uh, the European Union and the negotiations uh, for withdrawal have been, have been completed. We are actively engaging with all government departments at Brussels level, where preparatory work uh, is already uh, taking place um, and really talking to all uh, the departments and all the officials at all levels um, who have anything to do uh, with Brexit, uh, logistics and trade. I'm going to uh, introduce you to the ABC guide um, to, to Brexit on the next slide, please. So that's, that's basically the ABC guide um, Brexit and as you see we've tried to map out all the key issues from access to the market to vans. Uh, we tend to add new letters um, as discussions progress and as new issues arise but at the moment these are the, the issues that we are uh, looking at more specifically. In terms of domestic legislation um, the government wants to transpose EU law into UK law through the introduction of a great repeal bill, which should be introduced at the beginning of 2017. The Department of Transport is reviewing all the transport rules, so the transfer of EU law into UK law uh, may become effective upon withdrawal. Potential review and simplification of the domestic rules could then take place, um, but that's likely to take place after it's been uh, transposed into UK law. Obviously this is a process that we are going to follow very closely and we will engage the government at all levels uh, to ensure that the views of FTA members are heard and recognized. We are going to um, work on a manifesto, uh, in fact, uh, and the ABC Guide to Brexit will be the basis for this manifesto and that should be ready in the first quarter of next year. But what are the practical implications of Brexit for, for all of you? In the short term, until the UK leaves the EU, as I said, expect no radical changes. All EU rules and regulations still apply. Penalties also apply, by the way, if you don't respect the rules. Uh, obviously, pounds fluctuations already have an impact on FTA members, and not just importers and exporters, uh, but also operators. Because Brexit, well, the extent of changes depends very much on the kind of Brexit deal that the UK gets. Uh, but in any case, free trade is going to be a priority for FTA and will feature prominently in our manifesto that will be adopted next year. Next, please. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Alex Vich, who is head of global policy and is going to take you through the practical international trade issues in the UK as we head to Brexit. Alex, over to you. Thanks very much, Pauline. 
Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Beach, and as Pauline said, I'm the head of global policy here at uh, FTA. So, trade deals and tariffs. So, why are we here? Well, uh, as you may know already, um, the way that the EU uh, works in terms of international trade is that uh, the EU is a, a trading block with a C. So, it's the EU that negotiates trade deals with non-EU countries on behalf of all its members. Um, now, post-Brexit, the UK may need to make its own trade deals and preference policies. Now, the word may is highlighted there because uh, this is where life gets very complicated. Um, it, it, it depends really on what trade deal we do with the EU itself. Um, now, uh, I'm not going to go into that aspect of all this discussion today. What, what I would suggest is that uh, we did a, a webinar back in August which went into the kind of sort of customs and trade relationship that uh, could fall out of Brexit. Uh, so, for example, if the UK stays in the customs union, for example, it loses the ability to make its own free trade deals. Um, I'm going to take from my um, hypothesis here that we have completely left the EU. Uh, it's sort of hard Brexit, if you like, which means that we have full flexibility to make our own trade deals and um, tariff preferences. Um, now, we are, um, or have been really, uh, since July, working with our members um, to identify uh, what are their key export uh, markets and import to trade partners, what are their priorities for trade preferences and trade deals, and I'll come back to that. And we're also engaging with um, all the relevant departments, which is almost all of them, the Department for International Trade, uh, the uh, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, to up for transport and department for exiting the EU. So I'm going to go on to now some uh, feedback from member surveys that we've done recently on these issues. So first off, um, new trade deals. Um, what sort of countries do we need to be uh, to be dealing with? So we went out to our British Shippers Council, which um, as, as you, you, you may well know, FTA has a, a, a committee of uh, blue chip companies, retailers um, and exporters alike, accounting for, we think, around 70% of UK trade by volume a year. Um, it's a very important group for us, and it gives us a, a really good insight into the, uh, the challenges facing the logistics specialists in those countries. Uh, we did a simple survey with them. We're asking them, you know, look, which are your main origin countries, i.e. which countries are you buying from, and which are your main export markets, so which countries are you selling to? And uh, this is a very, very high level summary of what we got back. In terms of the uh, import countries, the origin countries, um, China came up almost all the time, India as well, and then a, a variety of other um, countries, you know, Ger Turkey, Germany, Vietnam, Ireland, as it says here on the slides. I think what's interesting when you do a kind of word cloud analysis of this is that it's mostly non-EU. So um, for, at least for our members, um, who are importing goods for primarily for retail, we're talking about non-EU imports. Um, exports, it's almost the exact inverse. So we had um, France and Germany on equal top spot for exports, um, and then a, a variety of other EU countries such as Spain and the Netherlands, and then to be fair, quite a lot of, of non-EU countries as well, including the USA, Middle East, and Far East. Um, but the, the theme here, what we want to get across is that, at least for our membership, it's, it's, it's all about um, origin countries, non-EU, um, and export EU with some other non-EU countries it's thrown in. And, and that finding is uh, very important in terms of what, we, what we're pressing government to do about trade deals and, and trade preferences. Um, now, the other thing we, uh, we've been working on is what kind of issues or uh, um, problems need to be solved for any new trade deals from the logistics and shippers' point of view. Um, just to run through them quickly, I'm not going to really uh, go into any detail here, but just to flag these up. Customs is a big one. You know, trade deals, uh, at least in part, are always about reducing red tape, delays and costs. Um, you know, that would be absolutely key. Um, to ensure that goods are, are imported and exported with a minimum of cost and delay. Uh, rules of origin, uh, it gets a bit techy, but basically for, for the UK, this is all about what we can uh, re-export to the EU. This gets very complicated, but it's absolutely critical for industries like the automotive sector, 
where let's say uh, it, let's say there's a Japanese-owned car manufacturer based in, in the northeast of England. What are the uh, what are the uh, customs taxes that the cars will have to pay? And indeed, what about the taxes that might be levied on the component parts of those cars during the process of manufacture? A lot of that in the press at the moment, as you probably know. Uh, going through the others a bit more quickly, issues around hygiene, very important for trade relationships. Um, UK's got a bit of a reputational issue lingering on with meat exports, for example. Um, sectors, are we talking about goods and services? How far do we liberalise our own markets? I mean, UK's pretty good at this already, but um, you know, we would normally expect other countries to liberalise their markets as well. Um, this has been a sticking point for quite a lot of the EU negotiations over the years. Um, product standards, how can we ensure products are safe and technically sound? And I wanted to throw in the last one about fast track negotiation. You know, to what extent can the UK copy and paste deals for, that, that, that came out of the EU? So, you know, EU, South Korea have a free trade relationship. Do we need to negotiate from scratch? Could we pick up the, 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 the key provisions for that and use that, sort of almost transpose that over into UK, UK regulation? But these are the things that we're trying to flag up to decision makers um, going forward. Uh, moving on, uh, trade preferences and some of the issues around that. A quick bit of context. Um, I'm going to go over this briefly, but please do feel free to log back in and look at this in more detail. What I mean by trade preferences is this really all about um, imports. So this is where there are um, certain countries, lower income or developing countries, who are allowed to um, have reduced or zero customs tax on their exports. And this is really all about trying to get, help those countries get <coughs> a foothold in the global economy and grow economically. The EU has a very good comprehensive system on this where um, they group countries into basically three different categories. Uh, there's a group of about 30 countries that fall into the uh, generalized system of preferences. And this is where the EU allows those countries to have uh, lower customs tax, basically lower tariffs, so to speak, on many of their product lines coming into the uh, into the European Union. Um, this was actually one of the very first things that our uh, retailer members mentioned to me when we started talking about this. You know, the, the, a lot of the products that we buy, particularly let's say textiles, uh, do rely heavily on these um, low import duties to keep costs low and to keep trade alive. This is really really important. Uh, Moving on, uh, there are two other aspects to this. GSP Plus, which is uh, 13 countries, benefit from um, full removal of duties on certain product lines, but only if they have a good, um, um, a good track record in environment, human rights and labor, and good governance and those kind of issues. And finally, everything but arms, this is for um, a, a United Nations list of what they refer to as least developed countries which are um, allowed, um, which are granted duty-free access to certain products. Um, and this is, um, what's quite useful about this is that the list of countries is kept by the UN. It's not about picking winners. And so again, these countries are allowed by the EU uh, duty-free access to certain products. Again, please do look at this in your, um, you know, at your leisure after this webinar. I realize this is um, a very quick introduction to this. Um, but it, it is really important, and, and you know, I don't get a sense that a lot of other business groups are talking about this, so we're really pressing this point. Um, now, when we spoke to our members, what, what would you want to happen or indeed not happen post-Brexit? There's a strong feeling that uh, you know, the UK should not just let this fall off a cliff. We should not default to uh, higher tariffs, which would come in automatically if we don't set up this trade preference scheme. Um, so on the GSP side of it, we asked them, well, look, let's say that the UK uh, adopts the way that the EU does it uh, on Brexit day. What would you like to happen in the future? And what was interesting to me was that um, uh, nearly three quarters of the members who, who came back to us said that they would actually like the UK to set up its own policy over time. So what we're seeing here is um, a transition period and then a process where the UK sets its own trading and tariff relationships with with the rest of the world. That was on GSP. Um, GSP Plus, you, um, we asked them the same question, you know, what, what, what do you want to see happen long term? Um, again, quite a, a, a majority in favor of keeping them in the short term. But then what's more interesting to me was that there, there was no consensus about whether 
this should be permanently linked to the EU list of countries or whether we should, should, we should go our own way on this. So GSP Plus uh, is something we, we probably want to drill down into and understand our members' views a bit more about. Um, and then going on, um, objectives and, um, and actions on trade. Um, look, when it comes to EU trade, it's very clear. We want a business-friendly Brexit. You know, we don't want any additional red tape or border delays or high costs. You know, that's what we that's what we want. That's very very clear from our members, and in fact, I, I would say that all the business community in Britain is, is saying this. Now, to the extent to which we can get this, given that all the political constraints, is another matter. But that's our message that we're taking into government. As far as the global trade, the trade with the rest of the world, I would just put this in two ways. Um, what our members are saying to us is that we want no disruptions. Um, you know, we have to make sure that the UK has set up all the trading systems, the trade preferences, uh, the tariff schedules within the WTO, things I haven't even mentioned in this seminar. All the paperwork behind the scenes needs to be done so that on Brexit plus one, uh, um, it's, it's seamless. Um, so the swan is still gliding along the pond, even though its legs are busy underneath the water. Um, the second part that I would call here is charting a new course. And we have had feedback that the members are, our members are keen to engage with government on how we can set a UK trade policy for the future. And this is where Brexit gets exciting. You know, this is the part that the pro-Brexit camp are very keen to talk about before the referendum. And we just want to make sure that the voice of, of our members and the business community is, uh, is, is strongly heard here. Um, and I'll just finish up with some of the actions that we're, 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 we're taking. And Pauline mentioned some of this at the start. You know, we are constantly working with members, understanding their needs and communicating to them um, of our understanding of, of the Brexit process. We're constantly engaging with ministers and government from uh, many different uh, departments. We've got a program of meetings, events and, and webinars, which FDA members um, are fully involved in and uh, we hope adding uh, clarity and value to their work on this. And also, um, we can announce that we, we will be um, having a uh, organising a trade and Brexit conference, going into some of the issues I've, I've mentioned here in more depth uh, in the first quarter of next year. So with that, I'm back over to Pauline. Thank you, Alex. Um, it's now now is, is the time for you actually to ask your questions. Um, so if you do want to ask questions, please use uh, the dedicated box on, on the tool that you have. Uh, as I said, we will really try our best to answer all the questions uh, we can. But if there are any unanswered questions, uh, they will be made available together with the answers, of course, uh, on the FTA website in the Brexit uh, dedicated section. Um, Oh, I see that we, we have a first question. Um, I think that's, that's one to you, Alex. Um, it's about uh, W2. Um, one of the participants asking, if, uh, is, is the UK a member of the WTO, and how does that work? Well, thanks, Pauline. Just, just quickly, um, the UK is a member of the World Trade Organization in its own right. However, we're now going to enter a uh, um, we're going to enter into uncharted territory where, um, as I mentioned earlier, the the, the, the tariffs, the, the import taxes, have been set uh, on the UK's behalf by the European Union. So the UK, what it will need to do is set up its own what they call a tariff schedule within the World Trade Organization, which will set out uh, essentially the import taxes on on, on products that we'll accept. Um, um, also, relevant to the point I made about the trade preferences, um, I went and met with the Commonwealth Secretariat trade policy team about this and also Department for International Trade and it's clear that the UK will need to get a special waiver from the other WTO members if it wants to bring in these lower tariffs, these trade preference schemes for, uh, uh, for certain developing countries. It, it, um, politically, I don't know how difficult that will be or otherwise, but these are the kind of um, things that the UK must do. This is some of the paperwork I was talking about before the UK has to do before Brexit in order to have a smooth flow of trade. OK, 
Okay, thank you, Alex. Uh, we have another one, which I think is perhaps more for me this time, on uh, what impact will next year's elections in France and Germany have? Uh, well, of course, I, I mentioned the changing political context. Uh, elections in France and Germany are, yeah, exactly what I had, what I had in mind. There might be further changes in Italy and the Netherlands. Um, the extent to which they will change the game uh, remains to be seen because it depends very much on who wins the elections in Germany, I guess. But as for France, uh, it seems very, very likely at this stage that uh, the current, the, the party which is currently in, in power. Uh, the left-wing uh, party, the Socialists, is probably not going to be re-elected. Um, so it looks quite likely at this stage that it would be uh, the Republican Party, which is a right-wing party. Um, so we're still you know, waiting to see who's going to be elected, but for sure, depending on the person uh, who's in charge and the party in charge, uh, there might be some differences. Um, it, it, it's hard to tell because um, everybody at EU level, I mean the EU 27, uh, have been very clear that they didn't want to stop negotiations until Article 50 was triggered. Uh, what we know, however, is that they are also busy working on their own positions um, and consulting with their own stakeholders. Uh, so, for instance, uh, it's my understanding that the Dutch government has started to um, talk to their own stakeholders to, to shape their own, their own position. Um, whether these positions would shift as well following the elections, well, again, it depends on who's, who's elected. Uh, and as we know, sometimes people can have a big impact on how the negotiations are, are conducted. So something we will follow uh, very closely, obviously. Um, meanwhile, we have another question, which is more for Alex this time, I think. Uh, what happens if the UK has no preferential deals in place when it leaves the EU? Oh, thanks. Uh, well, what will happen is the the um, the cost of the goods that have been given lower tariff rates will default to the general level uh, applied under the WTO rules. Um, so. I'll give you an example that's not quite right because it's not from a, a, one of these preference schemes. Well, let's take cars. So at the moment, a car can be made in Britain and exported into the EU, other EU countries, I should say, with no uh, tax attached to it, zero uh, customs duty. Um, um, there will, would be a 10% tax on that car if the UK has no special trade relationship with the EU. Now, um, it, it's quite hard to summarize across all product lines because when you drill down into it, um, different products have different co special codes and they're given different percentage rates of, of import duty. But, um, you know, it, this could be a significant issue. Um, I mean, I raised the issue of cars, but we're talking about, so in terms of the preference schemes, we're talking about textiles, um, some agriculture products, um, and, and um, another, um, you know, all kinds of manufacturers that you would uh, get from um, China and, and other countries like, uh, like like that, the producing countries. So we uh, we default to WTO rules and prices go up. Okay, thank you, Alex. Um, I, I think in the interest of time, uh, we're probably going to try and answer questions um, later on and, and, and make uh, the answers available onto the website. Um, so thank you very much to all of you for joining us today and for your questions. Um, the next webinar, uh, the next FTA Brexit webinar will take place on the 13th of December. It's likely to focus on the impact of Brexit on domestic legislation. Uh, so, you know, quite a different focus, but uh, if you follow that, we'll try and tell you more about the work that the government is doing and the work that we are doing also uh, in this field. Uh, generally speaking, for more information on the implications of Brexit and logistic, on logistics, uh, please visit the dedicated Brexit session uh, section of the EFTA website. You are also more than welcome to uh, follow us on Twitter, uh, Facebook, and we would strongly encourage you to take part in council meetings at both regional level and also if you are a shipper, the British Shippers Council. 
Uh, next year is going to be a very, very busy year, I think, uh, in terms of uh, what we are going to do on, on, on Brexit. Uh, as I said, one of the first actions will be the development of a manifesto in the first quarter of 2017. So if you want to have a say and you want your views and concerns to be heard and represented, uh, please join in uh, with FTA as we try together to lead for logistics on Brexit. So thank you very much to all of you. I hope this was useful. Uh, you'll find the recording on the website. And if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to contact us after the webinar. Thank you very much.